Well, that was very kind. <laughs> um, I'm excited to be able to share God's word this morning. Um, and it is his word. And so I pray that as we begin that you would really open your heart to what he has to say. Why don't we pray and just invite the Holy Spirit to speak. He has been speaking, but to really drill down on what he has to say to each one of us today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you love each one of us so much that you would choose to speak to us through your word. But we thank you also that you have spoken to us through your son. So help us to see Jesus clearly today and respond to him. Amen. Do you know the greatest miracle of all, we've been talking about miracle working faith. The greatest miracle of all is how Jesus works in a human life to bring transformation. How he transforms the human heart. We think we decide to follow Jesus, and of course we do. We do. For those of us here who've made a response to him and said, you know, I want to follow you, Jesus. Out of all you've done for me, I want to follow you. But it's only really in looking back on the activity of God in our life that we can say and see, you know what, actually, God has been doing some miracle work, some orchestration. He's been arranging circumstances. He's been at work in my life to bring me to a point where I can hear about Jesus and respond to him. Do you know there's so much activity and working and wooing and sovereign orchestration of events and circumstances from God's part that he takes the initiative and he orchestrates his saving work in our lives. It's amazing to see and to watch him at work. Do you know there's a famous preacher and minister from the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, who tells the story of a man who once went to church to listen to the singing, but he didn't want to hear the preaching, so he put his fingers in his ears. I've actually had that before where I've preached and someone's put their fingers in their ears. It's really encouraging. So if you're thinking they're doing that today, you know, God bless you. <laughs> But as soon as the pastor began speaking, he, he did this. And after a while, an insect landed on his face. So he had to take one of his fingers out of his ears to swat the insect away. And just as he did that, the preacher said, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and so the pastor must have been reading the words from, of Jesus recorded in Matthew eleven fifteen, 15, because suddenly the man thought, oh, he's talking to me. I better start listening. So he began to listen, and God met with him powerfully, and he became a devoted follower of Jesus. You know, we can be determined that we're not going to listen to what he has to say, but God has a way of getting our attention, don't you reckon? <laughs> Last year on the 3rd of September, we had, uh, 3rd of December, we had a water baptism service here at the Christian Family Centre at night. And water baptism is an outward symbol of what has already taken place. Jesus uh, commands us to be baptised, if, if, to publicly identify ourselves as followers of Christ. And we had a water baptism here and there was three people who got baptised. It was an amazing service, but... Um, I just wanted to quickly mention, as a, an example of the miracle working God, one of the, the men who stood and publicly declared his faith was Louis Garacci. Hi, Louis. <laughs> Didn't know you were going to be in the sermon today. <laughs> but he stood up and said, you know, I'm getting baptised because I want to follow Jesus and declare my allegiance to him. And you see, God had been working powerfully in Louis's life to bring him to a point of bowing his knee to Jesus. But in an unexpected set, set of circumstances, his father, Mario, a wonderful man who was part of our church family and is now in Jesus' presence in heaven, he became unwell and was admitted to hospital. And one of our creative ministries team members, Lee Triantfalu, and, um, was at the hospital to support Louis' sister, Angela, and mum, Maria, who also come to our church. Lee reached out to Louis in a time of great pain and uncertainty and shared with Louis that God not only loved him, but that no matter what happened with his dad, that he could have a heavenly father who would be there for him and that he could see his dad again in heaven. 
Lee shared with Louis the good news of what Jesus has done on our behalf. He explained to Louis how to receive Jesus' offer of forgiveness and eternal life and how to turn from the way he'd been living and turn his life over to Jesus' control. And he was there when Louis invited Christ to come and live in him and lead his life. And so a wonderful miracle took place that day. And it's been awesome to see you worshipping the Lord Louis here faithfully every week. You're a changed man. (laughs) But in the middle of grief and loss, Jesus came up close and personal and got his attention. And Louis has been following Christ ever since. God was at work. He was at work. Even through the circumstance of his dad's illness. It's amazing when you see how God works in our lives. Looking back, I can see God's activity at work in my life. And for many of us here, maybe you're thinking about scenarios and people and ways that God has been working to lead you to a point where you come to faith in Jesus. Maybe some of you here today haven't taken that step of faith yet, but I think God's been at work to get you here, to be at church today, to hear this message, to keep hearing about Jesus, to explore more about him. God made me for himself, but I wasn't looking for him or interested in knowing him. He did everything necessary to make it actually possible for me to have right relationship with him. And he did the same for you. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19a, it says, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. God was in Christ reconciling the world, making a way for people to know him, not counting their sins against them. When I wasn't even looking for him, before I was even born, Jesus had already died in my place for my sin. So this barrier that separated me from a holy God could be dealt with so that my sin could no longer be counted against me. And Jesus took the punishment for my sin. Why would he do this? In one sense, it doesn't make sense. We can't wrap our heads around it, but we accept it and we receive it. That He did it because he loves me. And he so loves every person he created that he asked his son, we sang about it this morning, he asked his son to carry the heavy weight of sin. He asked his son to willingly lay down his life and shed his blood on the cross to pay the price for every person to be able to be forgiven. If you haven't heard this for a while or have forgotten it or it's just we need to hear it every day, God loves you like crazy. He loves you like crazy. He gave his son to prove it and Jesus' ultimate sacrifice demonstrates it, shouts it unequivocally. This is how much I love you. He secured the way for you to come back to him, to turn your life over to him, to get your life right with him, to begin a brand new intimate relationship as his adopted child. What's your response? You can receive him. You can't do anything to pay him back. You can receive him. You can believe upon Jesus today. You can receive his free offer of forgiveness. Give the control of your life, just like Louis did, just like that man who came in so determined not to listen to the preaching. God got his attention, and today God's getting your attention, the fact that you're here. He loves you like crazy, and he wants you to be in relationship with him. What did he do to deserve death on a cross? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. What did you do to deserve his mercy and free gift of kindness? Nothing. It's a gift. But you have to receive it if you want to experience it. I have been saved from a dead-end life of living for myself. (laughs) But I've also been set free to love and serve my king. And he wants that experience for every person to Be and do what we're made for. And he was actively at work to soften my heart and bring me into his family. He was drawing me. He was wooing me. I could go off and list so many circumstances and things that he lined up just so, so that I would have an opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. How about you? 
Can you see the activity of God working to draw you to him? Maybe you've never thought about it before. In Luke 19 verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. We often focus on the save part because what Jesus did was so enormous and we rightly should. (laughs) But today I want us to focus and just examine and explore and dig deeper a little bit into the seeking part. I feel like God just highlighted that to me and for us to hear about today because it speaks to the activity of God, the working of God to bring someone to himself. I want us to look at a woman in John chapter 4. And uh, it's a big contrast with John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, we meet a man called Nicodemus who was a religious man, (laughs) a religious leader. Uh, He was someone who was held in high esteem, was part of the ruling council. He was well-educated, knew the scriptures, um, impeccable character. He came to Jesus at night because he didn't really want his mates in the ruling council to know that he was asking questions about who Jesus was. So he came to Jesus. And you've got to read that, how Jesus answers and responds to him. He basically says, you know what, I don't want to get into a dialogue. And he went straight to talking about that Nicodemus, though he knew the scriptures and knew all these things and was this impressive guy, that he needed to be reborn, actually come spiritually alive to God as he put his trust in Jesus. So you can read that. But in John chapter 4, there's a massive contrast. We meet someone, a woman, unnamed, from a people group that were really hated, actually, by the Jews. (laughs) She was hated because she was a Samaritan, and Samaritans were viewed by Jewish people as spiritual half-breeds. They were related to... um, the Jewish people way, way back, part of the northern kingdom of Israel that then broke away and, and that, that whole um, Samaria and everything fell and uh, they racially, they intermarried with people living in their nation who were not from the Israelites. And so because of this racial intermarriage, they were no longer considered to be truly Jewish. They were actually hated. And under Jewish law, a Jewish person would have been defiled and spiritually unclean by associating with this woman. And so it says that she came and happened upon Jesus about noon, broad daylight, on her own, in the heat of the day, this woman came to a place called Jacob's Well to fill her water container. And often we focus on her and talk about her, but I was just struck by the miracle-working faith of Jesus in seeking her. I want us to look at that, um, unpack that. In John chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, it says this. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, talking about John the Baptist. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee, Now he had to go through Samaria. And I'd always, that little, he had to go. I'd always skipped over that and thought, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. I understand talking about geographical things. But it's actually not talking about geography there. Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria in the way that we thought he had to. We think geography when we hear that. But if you take a look at this map, The dotted line is the usual route, the indirect route that every Jewish person would take to get from Judea through to Galilee. They completely avoided going into Samaria because they hated Samaritans. And so the usual way for people to take when they were journeying from um, Judea to Galilee was not through Samaria. But Jesus took the direct route. When the text says he had to go through Samaria, I actually think God is giving us a picture of what compelled Jesus to go through there. He was compelled to go through Samaria because the Holy Spirit had shown him that either he was to seek out a conversation with a woman who he would meet at a well, or maybe the Holy Spirit just said to him, I want you to take the direct route this time. I don't want you to go that way. I want you to go this way. And he stepped out in obedience. You know, Jesus, while he was on this earth, fully relied on the Holy Spirit. 
I don't, this is my guess, I don't really know, but I don't think he had the whole situation mapped out in front of him. I think as he took steps of obedience that God actually unveiled and showed him what the big picture was. He was being led of the Spirit and obedient to his Father's will. He had to go through Samaria because it was part of his Father's will. It was part of his purposeful mission. He had an appointment with an unnamed woman who was hated and he had to go through Samaria. In John 4, 4, it says, Now he had to go through Samaria. We've got that bit. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar or Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. You know what I noticed about this? The Holy Spirit just started to just show me little things about Jesus and his miracle-working faith. He wearied himself to get to that well. It actually took deliberate effort for him to get to that place to be able to talk to that woman. He was inconvenienced. It might have taken him days to get there. The journey took deliberate effort. Maybe the Holy Spirit prompted him that it was time to take a rest right there by that well, to send his disciples off to the nearest town to get themselves some food, and then they were going to carry on on their journey. But maybe the Holy Spirit showed him that he needed to be waiting there, right there, right at that time, because there was someone who was coming that he needed to talk to. Perhaps as she was walking towards him, the Holy Spirit nudged him, ask the woman who arrives at the well for a drink. The Father is drawing her. (laughs) She's going to be one of your followers, Jesus. Get ready. Here she comes. And when she arrives, Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? The Son of God asked an unnamed woman, in that culture, who was hated for a drink. That's amazing. The Samaritan woman says to him, what? You're a Jew. You're a single Jewish man. You shouldn't even be talking to me. I'm a Samaritan and you're asking me for a drink? What's going on? She she was bowled over because Jesus crossed a barrier to speak to her. He crossed a barrier He crossed a racial barrier. He crossed a social barrier. He crossed a cultural barrier to speak to her. And she didn't know what to make of that. (laughs) But Jesus answered her in John 4 verse 10. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He doesn't want to get stuck on the nitty gritty of who should be associating with who. It's glaringly obvious that he has taken a step and crossed a barrier and spoken to her. (laughs) It's glaringly obvious that he's taken an interest in her. He doesn't even answer that question. He actually talks to something much deeper, the deepest longing of every human heart. He starts to talk to her about meaning and purpose. The longing for meaning and purpose. He starts to spark and stimulate in her a spiritual thirst. He leaves the conversation open-ended. The ball is now in her court. If she wants to unpack what this gift of God is, if she wants to find out more about what he's talking about, about living water, she can. So he's got her attention. Verse 11 and 12. She tries to brush Jesus off, implying, almost like, who do you think you are? Who is it that I'm actually talking to here? (laughs) A, you've got nothing with you to get the water out of the well, and it's pretty deep. B, living water. I don't see any other water around except for this well right here. So not sure we're going to get the living water from. Are you greater than my ancestor Jacob who dug this well that got handed down to generation after generation until now? I mean... Basically, she's saying, Mr. Are you crazy? That's my paraphrase. That's what she's saying. Mr. Are you crazy? What are you talking about? There's no water. The well's deep. What are you going to do? Make it appear out of nowhere? 
But Jesus refused to be distracted by the fact that she doesn't get what he's saying just yet. He gently and respectfully keeps her real need on the table, meaning and purpose. He answers the question behind the question because he's seeking her. And I think he would have been praying in his heart, Father, help me. Holy Spirit, open her heart to the truth of what I'm saying right now. Right there, he keeps seeking her. He keeps drawing her. He stays focused on this spiritual reality of her need for God instead of her immediate reactions. And we start to see a miracle take place before Jesus because he activated his miracle working faith and stepped out. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You know, Jesus is the Son of God, but when he walked this earth, he's also called the Son of Man, and he relied on the Holy Spirit. So with his own natural human eyes, he perhaps couldn't see just yet the result of what he was believing for. But he stepped out in faith. He released his faith because he knew that this woman that he'd been involved in making, I know it's crazy trying to get your head around it, he knew that she was made to be with him forever. He knew that she was made to know God as her heavenly father. He knew that she was to leave her old life that was riddled with shame and disappointment and experience new life, the new life that he would offer and he was offering. So in John 14, Verse, sorry, John 4, verse 13, he answers her. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He said, everyone who drinks this water, you know there's a longing in you for something deeper because you were made for eternity. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. You're looking for something to satisfy your soul. But the only thing that will fundamentally, ultimately satisfy you is a relationship with me, with the God who made you for himself. It's real living water, the source of life that never runs out and that never runs dry that you're looking for. You don't even know you're looking for it, but that's what you're looking for. And she responds, okay, seems like you really going on about this living water, you have an answer to my problems, great. If you could just make a spring appear, perhaps closer to where I live, it would be much easier for me. I wouldn't have to come here every day and find this water. I mean, she's, she's I think she's just going along with playing along, thinking, yeah, yeah, this guy might be a bit crazy. <laughs> but Jesus says, I don't want to answer just your problems. I know everything about you. Go and call your husband and come back. She says, I don't have a husband. I said, you're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and the man that you're now with is not your husband. And she's like, okay, this is getting a little weird. <laughs> I think that's what she thought to herself. But basically she asked, I can see that you're a shepherd. It's like, whoa, what's, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> And basically, my paraphrase is, she says, well, I'm not really into the whole Jewish religion thing. My ancestors were okay to worship on this mountain right here. You Jews claim we must worship in Jerusalem. Again, Jesus doesn't get pushed off track. He says, you know what? God is seeking worshippers, true worshippers. It doesn't matter where, where physically you worship. The time's coming. It's now here where true worshippers will worship God Enabled by the Holy Spirit and out of the core, out of the authenticity of their whole lives. As they agree with what the scripture says about me and who he says that I am, they'll worship me. And she responds with what a lot of us do when things are a little bit up close and personal, thinks, hmm, okay, this is getting a little bit heated. I'll think about that later. She basically says, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. I don't want to think about this right now. And this is when Jesus reveals who he is to her. John 4 verse 26, it says, Then Jesus declared, I 
the one speaking to you. I am he. And the lights go on. The Holy Spirit helps her understand, makes it abundantly clear. It's, it's true. It's true. And I reckon, just try and put yourself into the situation of what thoughts would have been flooding into her mind as she comes to this realisation. I have a guess about what she was thinking because I'm trying to put myself in that situation. <laughs> you? You are the gift of, of God. Wait, this actually really is a gift of God? You? You're the one who offers me living water? Wait, there is such a thing as eternal life? You are the Messiah? The one I'd heard about right here in front of me? You? You know everything about me. And you asked me for a drink, me. But you know everything, like everything about me. You know, oh my goodness, you know everything about me. And you're still standing there. And your eyes, there's kindness, the kindness and the joy and the life in your eyes. And right there, at the end of John, it's like John, the movie director, goes, cut because I want to know what happened next and what Jesus said to her don't you she's like wow this is amazing what did he say to her what did she say back did they like embrace and she's like Jesus I believe in you you know did she get down on her knees did he say to her leave your life you don't have to deal with that stuff anymore you don't have to dabble in or settle for sin you can actually follow me did he say don't be afraid just believe did he say I came looking for you this whole purpose of me coming into Samaria was to find you and now you're found and you're going to be with me forever in paradise? I don't know. I'm guessing. He could have said that. <laughs> but right then, the disciples come back. And though there is a miracle of God taking place in front of their eyes, they completely miss it. <laughs> They were at best disinterested, at worst they were apathetic and self-righteous. They start asking Jesus about food. They were surprised when they saw him talking to a woman, but they were just giving off weird vibes. They didn't ask, why are you talking to her or why are you talking to Jesus? And I tell you this whole story, thanks for being patient, I hope you're interested. <laughs> I tell you this whole story as recorded in the book of Acts, uh, the book, the Gospel of John, because don't you reckon often our response is like the disciples? So often we miss what Jesus is doing because we don't have our spiritual antennas up. We're not alert to when the Spirit is already at work in someone's life. Sometimes we might, but if you're like me, often we miss it. We're distracted by the day-to-day -day tasks in front of us. We, we're looking down at where we're going and what we have to get ticked off our to-do lists. Many of us are not actually expecting Jesus to do miracles right in front of our eyes and use us to share the hope we have in him. Far too easily we forget that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And he invites us to be part of the seeking process. Like yesterday, when I went to buy some new shoes. And the shop assistant says to me, so have you got plans for the rest of the weekend? And only after walking out of the shop I went, oh, I missed it. Like, I wasn't going to go, yes, and I'm preaching, and it's going to be awesome, and you should believe in Jesus. But I could have said something, perhaps, perhaps something that said a question behind a question that maybe sparked some sort of spiritual thirst in her, maybe opened up the conversation a bit more. It's like God landed this opportunity right in my lap, and I missed it. And I'm not going to beat myself up about it because Jesus doesn't condemn me or point the finger at me accusingly. But I so long to be more like him and operate his miracle working faith. Do you? 
We're not going to do it perfectly, but he wants us to partner with what he's doing in this seeking and saving of people. And I'm praying and asking the Lord to fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit and keep on giving me this compelling urgency that was just oozing out of Jesus because he had to go through Samaria. He had to. His love compelled him to go. I'm praying that God will keep giving me his compelling urgency to cross social, racial or cultural barriers, even unspoken ones. To rely on the Holy Spirit to help me engage in spiritual conversations. To cooperate with his Holy Spirit and keep my ears attuned to his promptings. To step out and trust the Lord to step in with power. But mostly, I'm praying God would help me expect real salvations. That I'd sow a seed that would help someone take a step closer to Jesus. Or that I'd actually have the privilege of leading them to faith in Christ. And it's a prayer I know Jesus is committed to answering. (laughs) Because it's what he's about. In Matthew 9, it says that he went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. When he saw them, when he really saw them, when he saw with spiritual eyes, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He's the Lord of the harvest. And he wants us to engage in his harvest work. And if Jesus hadn't gone to Samaria, he would never have met this woman. An unlikely woman who God used to reach a whole massive amount of people in her town. You can read the rest of the story in John 4. She can't hold it in, what Jesus, meeting Jesus. She runs back to her. She leaves the water jar. She's like, Poor water schmorter. I've met Jesus. And she runs back to her town. And she can't, she's like, come and see, this is amazing what this man has done. He knows everything I've ever did. They were like, okay. So they start coming out towards Jesus and all the, he ended up staying with them for two more days and all these people come to believe in him. He had to go through Samaria. His steps of faith and reliance on the Holy Spirit resulted in a mighty harvest We don't know what steps of obedience that we take, what the fruit of that will be. We leave the results up to God. But we take those steps of obedience because it says, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And he's given us the message, so the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. And the the ministry of reconciliation is God's not angry with you. He loves you. Be reconciled to him. You can know him. I know him. He's awesome. Do you want to know him? Do you want to come to church with me and see how cool God is, what he's doing, how amazing, how wonderful, how he can transform your life? The end of last year, as I was thinking about 2018, I distinctly felt the Holy Spirit giving me a God whisper. And I know that this is according to his will because it's what he talks about. But that in, and it's what Pastor Bill has been talking about, what we've been talking about as a team. But then in 2018, our local church will be renewed again with a compelling urgency to share Jesus. Compelling urgency. Compelling urgency to share with people who really are lost without him. You rub shoulders with them every day. They're in your family. They're on your street. They're in your school and God's put you in their life and he's working in their life and he wants to use you to do a miracle right in front of your eyes. I know this has application for the people who come to know Jesus through our next church plant, CFC South. Man, I think there's going to be a mighty harvest, believing for it. Awesome. But there's also application for us here. (laughs) 
to gather a harvest, there's an urgency to get it done in a certain time frame so the crop is not spoiled. There's a spiritual, the spiritual harvest is even more urgent because we know Jesus is coming back. We don't know the time or day. It says he's going to come like a thief in the night. There's an urgency. I think about that sometimes. Jesus, you could come back tomorrow. Flip. <laughs> like it actually prompts us into action to take seriously his words, go. To reap a harvest in biblical times, there needed to be many laborers for the work of harvesting. There were no tractors. There wasn't a big harvester machine with a guy with his glasses on listening to the cricket, driving along, going... Wasn't a one-man show, people. It was a harvest of laborers in the harvest, working shoulder to shoulder with one instrument in their hand, doing their bit to reap a crop. In John 4, verse 35 to 36, he reminds his disciples this morning, he's reminding us, don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, I tell you, I'm Lord of the harvest and I'm telling you, church, (laughs) open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest, even now. The one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Open your eyes. Not just down, next step in front of you. Attune your ear. What is God doing? How is he at work? What is the part he's wanting you to play? In 1 Thessalonians 1, which has been part of our life journal reading this book for the last week. But I read the other day and it really stood out to me. It says, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Your labour prompted by love. And your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus. And then just a few verses later it says, The Lord's message rang out from you. Imagine if the Lord's message rang out from us. What could God do? When we align our faith and release our faith and believe that he could use us, what could he do this year? I'll tell you what he could do. We could pack this place. Do you believe that? Work produced by faith. Faith gives us the ability to see, to open our eyes and see what God sees. Labour prompted by love. You know, we're not meant to just endure having to tell people about Jesus. It's a work of love. It's a passion. It's it's something we weary ourselves in and we don't give up in because we love God and we love people. And it's an endurance inspired by hope in Jesus. As some of you have been believing for family members and loved ones for years. Years. Don't give up. Keep praying for them. You know, God prompted me and maybe he's prompting you. There's 10 more days left in January. What happens if you would pray and even fast a meal, fast Facebook, fast a coffee, set your faith and your sights on God and say, God, move in their life. He's given me the names of three people. Who is he wanting you to pray for? To get serious about being part of his labourers in the harvest field. Jesus displayed such miracle working faith. And he's saying to us today, church, would you follow my example? Would you, like I had to do this week, would you repent? Would you change your mind if there's been times and opportunities that you have not had your spiritual eyes open, when you have not been looking up and seeing what I'm doing, would you turn back again to me and ask me to fill me, to fill you with the Holy Spirit? Because I'll do it. You want to pray a bold prayer? Say, here I am. <laughs> Use me, God, as one of your laborers. He'll do it. But he asks us to turn our hearts back again, to have his heart of love and compassion 
to be part of that seeking process. Not just one or two or three or four or 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 40. You know, it's easy in a church to think, oh, that's someone else's job. You know, no, God wants to use you right where you are with the people you know and love. Why don't we pray together?